Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of these feeble lips and the reflections of our souls be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My grandmother on my, my great-grandmother on my father's side, Alice Pliny Thornton Harris was her name. Pretty stern woman. And she had a saying when she heard something or saw something she didn't particularly care for, uh, we would come rushing in the house and she'd say, okay, you may need to go out and check your attitude at the door. And we knew that she was serious and we checked our attitudes and because we didn't want to do the switch dance. Do y'all know what the switch dance is? How many of you did the switch dance as a child? Okay. Okay. Child abuse still lives. Okay. Uh. There are many types of cheers in this world. You know, at sporting events, we even have cheerleaders, just in case the cheering isn't as energetic as it should be. You know, when you're 20 points ahead, everybody's excited. You get 20 points behind, and we start sitting on our hands and talking about what's, you know, talking about work next week. And the cheerleaders come rolling out, and they try to get us excited again uh, about the game. But when things are going well, we're excited, and, and there's a roar in the stadium, and the, the offensive line is blocking great, and the passes are sailing, and the tailback is breaking uh, yard after yard. And when he crosses the goal line, there's this big uproar of cheers that go on. And then he does that silly little dance in the end zone. I don't quite understand, but uh, we really get excited about those touchdowns. Cheers. There are other kinds of cheers. You know, in business, if you're very successful at, and there's money, profits made, at the end of the year, there may be an office party and somebody might sing, he's a jolly good fellow, or say hip, hip, hooray, because the bonus checks are getting cut. You know, at a Broadway play, when it's done well and it's written well, uh, the, the audience is, is energetic. And at the end of the play, they may break out in author, author, in celebration of how well it was written. Performers, directors, musicians, vocalists, when they've done very well in their performance, they may get an encore, encore, and they come out and provide just a little bit more for us. And we could have shouted encore for the choir this morning, I think. Yes, there are many kinds of cheers for many kinds of people. The politician, well, they, they get the vote. The, the, the soldier gets the medal. The star athlete might get a scholarship, or if he's a pro athlete, a multi-million dollar contract for a Nike commercial. Attorneys become judges. Doctors get diseases named after them. Preachers get a Sunday school class named after them. Now, I understand that some of these are Christians, too. But I wonder what kind of cheer goes up for the run-of-the-mill, rank-and-file Christian who has modeled their life after Jesus Christ and has struggled to do the right thing, to be the right thing, to promote the right thing. What kind of cheer or applause goes up for that person? Or is there one? Do they hear the roar of the crowd when someone gives a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus Christ? Do they hear an applause when they go the second mile or the third mile? Do they hear someone say thank you when they have gone beyond the call of duty and given their cloak and coat to someone? Do they get a standing ovation 
when it is certain that they see themselves as living out the kingdom of God in their life, where they are. Does someone, anyone, say that a boy or that a girl when they see the Christian turn the other cheek for the second smack? Hardly. If done properly, if it's done the way Jesus has asked it to be done, his ministry and mission, it's usually done behind the curtain. It's usually done off stage. It's usually done out of the limelight. It's done when nobody notices. There is no um, attention called to the act. When people are living out the kingdom the way Jesus calls them to live it out, it's usually done quietly, without any pomp, without any circumstance. Nobody's trying to drop names. Nobody's trying to say, look what I did or what I have done. They just do it. A hundred years ago, I pastored a, a, a Mill Hill Church up in Spartanburg County. And I remember this fellow used to meet me at the door. He owned a, a, a boat shop. He, he sold boats and, and, and uh, rod and reels and tackle. And a quite lucrative business. And he would meet me at the door every Sunday morning and he would tell me what he had done that week. Guess who I fed this week, preacher? Guess how much money I gave to the United Way? Guess what I did this way or that way? On and on and on it went. And I kept thinking as he would say those kinds of things. Miss Esther Israel back there across Lawson's Fort Creek up on the hill, uh, living in a shanty, receiving $350 a month from Social Security, giving $70 a month to the church. Quietly. Not wanting anybody to know what she was giving to her church. Now, I know that, not because I looked up to see how much she gave to the church, but when I first went there, one of the duties of the pastor was to go up to Mr. Is Miss Israel's house and get her tithes and offerings. You had to go up to get it. And I remember the first time I saw it, I tried to give it back. I was so embarrassed. I tried to give it back to Miss Esther. And she said, oh, no, preacher. My church comes first. That's the way the kingdom usually plays itself out. And what Bob didn't know is how Esther would stand uh, and cook pecan pies in her house for the United Methodist women to sell for their bake sale to send the missions. And she stood on a walker hour after hour baking pies quietly humbly. Who cheers for Esther? Who celebrates Esther? Who shouts encore to Esther Israel? Now, like you, uh, I have an image of Jesus um, sharing this, this sermon, this sermon on the plain or sermon on the mountain, uh, he goes and sits down and this throng of people just surrounds him and he begins to teach. That may not be accurate. Read the text. The text says Jesus saw the multitude and he went up the hill. It's almost as though Jesus wanted to get away from that multitude. Okay? He went up the hill when he saw the multitude. And then he sat down and began to teach the disciples. The multitude is secondary to the whole story. The disciples are primary to the story. So he's sitting there in a sort of like the rabbis of that day did. He sat and the students reclined around him and he began to teach. And I imagine that the multitude crept up that hill and got in behind those disciples as he taught the disciples about the kingdom of God. There was probably the, the, the single mother, a widowed mother there with, with children, worried about how she was going to feed her children. 
There was probably some aged people there too in that crowd standing in the back because they don't want to get pushed and knocked down. Worried. There's no social security. There's no pension fund. Unless family takes them in, there's no way to live except to beg. They're probably standing back there on the fringe. There's probably the ones standing there, the head of the family, the man who can't figure out where to go to find food or how to find a job, worried that he's going to be able to feed his family or not. They're there. And they're listening. And Jesus begins to teach those disciples there. Now, we can approach this text two ways. We can go and take it apart Uh, part and parcel, and talk about each little segment. Or we can talk about the sermon as a whole, which I think is more accurate, is to talk about the whole. Now here's the thing. Uh, In the Greek language, like the English language, there's parts of speech. And in this, and I've never seen this before until recently, when I was preparing myself for this, I I saw this, and it just woke me up. This section... um, is not in the imperative voice. Jesus is not telling these disciples, this is what you have to do to be in the kingdom of God. That's not what he's saying. You don't have to be mourning. You don't have to be poor in spirit. uh, You don't have to be impoverished to get into the kingdom of God. Instead, this voice here is indicative. It's an indicator. Those in the kingdom are like this. In other words, this is the character and this is the personality of kingdom dwellers. Those in the kingdom, when when something bad happens, someone dies in your family and you mourn, you're still blessed. There's a blessing for you because you're in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom and you become poor, you're blessed because you're in the kingdom. You don't do these things to get into the kingdom. So, they're attitude indicators. And if you look at these attitudes, they're completely contrary to the modern world. You follow this, and the world is going to think you insane. They're going to think you've gone crazy. But, They're the indicators, nevertheless. Now, as I've told you before, I used to fly airplanes. And um, one of the instruments in a cockpit is an attitude indicator. Great piece of equipment. On the bottom, it's about that big around, and on the bottom, it's either brown or black, indicating ground, And at the top, it's blue, and there's a line through the middle. And when you're flying, you can tell if you're in a nose-up attitude. In other words, you're climbing and the houses are getting smaller. Or an attitude down, and you're descending, and the houses are getting bigger. Or you may be in level flight and climbing. The whole plane is lifting because you're hitting thermals. Or... The plane is descending because the plane is being pushed down by thermals. It also tells you if you're turning, if you're in a bank or a turn. So it's a great piece of equipment to have. And I think these Beatitudes are an attitude indicator for us. For those who are struggling to to follow Jesus in the way, who are residing in the kingdom of God, they tell us something about ourselves. They, they should indicate our relationship with Jesus Christ. They should indicate our relationship with the holy as well. I want to tell you a story about a fellow by the name of Jerry. Jerry is a chef in upstate New York. And he's uh, 
a, a, a great chef. People really like Jerry, and uh, they love what he creates. And when Jerry moves from one restaurant to another restaurant, the whole wait staff goes with him. Other chefs go with him. And the reason is they love Jerry. Jerry has a positive attitude, and they say when you're around Jerry, he just lifts you up. He attracts you like a magnet. You just want to be around Jerry. He's got a positive attitude about life. He's got a positive attitude about the world. He's got a positive attitude about people. And it attracts people to him. They just want to naturally be with him. Well, he went to this one restaurant, and at night it was... Uh, the owner of the restaurant gave him the job of putting the, reven the, the receipts in the safe. And just as he went, turned the, the lock on the safe, he put the money in and turned the lock on the safe, locking the money in, someone knocked the, the back door open, and it was a robber. And he pointed the gun to Jerry's head, and Jerry began to tremble like the rest of us would. And he knelt down to the floor, and he begins trying to open the safe, and he can't remember. He's, you know, he's just fuddled and uh, the robber gets so angry with him that he backs up and shoots Jerry three times now <clears throat> he says the miracle began right there ambulance people were just down a block away they responded immediately they got him in the in the ambulance and he looks up and he sees the paramedic and how grimaced his face was and he tells the paramedic don't worry I'm going to live and the paramedic just smiled and was assured that he was going to die before they got him to the hospital. But he makes it to the hospital. And he gets on, when they're going down the hallway on the gurney, people are looking down at him. And he saw this rather large nurse with a grimace on her face. And he said to her, don't worry, I'm going to live. And she smiled. And they got him into the operating room. And they're around, and, and, and one of the physicians says, are you allergic to anything? He said, yes, sir. And everybody stops. And they're waiting for Jerry to respond. And he says, I'm allergic to bullets. <laughs> okay. And then he told the surgeon, he said, operate on me as a person who is alive. Don't operate on a dead man. I'm going to survive. And he did. And the surgeon said between his faith, Jerry's faith, and that positive attitude, what, that was the reward for him, life. That's what gave him life. His faith and his attitude gave him life. You know, folks, if you, if you really want to be a person that gets everything you want out of life, Everything you think um, you want or any, everything you look for, if you really want to be someone who gets everything you look for, all you have to be is a fault finder. A fault finder. You can find it anywhere you look. All you have to be is a complainer and a critic and a whiner. You will be satisfied. But I tell you what you won't get is people who will want to be around you like Jerry. They will not be attracted to you like Jerry. Instead of following you from place to place, they'll be running from you from place to place. Attitude. Attitude indicators. I wonder what our attitude is like. The, attitude, the Beatitudes are indicators of the kingdom dwellers. They, they have repented of their sins. They have a renewed relationship with God. So when adversity strikes, they're blessed. They're blessed. Regardless of circumstance or situation, they're blessed. How's your attitude?
Is it a blessing? For you? For others? The change of attitude is simple. It begins with repentance. Amen.